So today I want to talk about something. This isn't really going to be a screencast, but more or less kind of a podcast, I guess. I want to talk about Cordova applications, which you may know as PhoneGap, or you may know as Ionic. Um, Ionic has a little bit different meaning than PhoneGap or Cordova, but generally anything that uses the Cordova stack. There, there are a couple things that are associated with Cordova. First of all, it's slow. Um, obviously, you get multiple targets. And and then the last one is just the look and feel. Um, not really, the, the usability, I guess I can say. So I'll try to go over those points and um, help you understand what Cordova really is and whether or not you should really choose it for your product. This is, you know, a consumer product or business app application or whatever you want to choose. So I'm going to hit home with the core issue that a lot of people have with Cordova. And this is something that feels almost like walking on, I want to say, paper rice. Um, you have to be extraordinarily precise on everything you choose if you want to target all the platforms and have the best experience. Let me give you an example. There are There's something called virtual scrolling. And this is a little bit different than the another type of virtual scrolling, but this virtual scrolling is to work around one of the scrolling problems. In a web view where you get HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, you can scroll, but you don't get all these events while scrolling. Some of the UI doesn't update, um, like if you if you scrolled up and you want a scrolling animation while going up, you you just don't get that. You, you're not able to interact with the application while the user's scrolling. And so, a lot of these frameworks, the JavaScript frameworks, they implement what's known as virtual scrolling. So they emulate the scrolling mechanism that you have. For iOS, it's almost unnoticeable. You can't even tell. For Android, for newer devices. It's very hard to tell. But for the older devices or lower, lower end devices, you can really tell. And for Windows Phone, you can really tell. Things start chunking and it goes slow. You start scrolling and nothing's happening. That's virtual scrolling. And again, that's so you can have pull to refresh or you can have good animations while scrolling. This is so you get what a lot of people assume is native functionality into your app. And so a lot of the times you just don't have the choice but to, to accept that. And if you're going to choose something like virtual scrolling to get pulled to refresh, then you're going to have to start limiting the number of devices that you're going to support, as well as the number of platforms, as well as versions. So if you want to have something like pull to refresh and you know, all this scrolling stuff that's, that's associated with Ionic, you're going to need to be able to say, okay, I'm only going to support the newest version of iOS and the newest versions, the last newest two newer versions of Android, maybe 4.4. And this way you can isolate to yourself to say, okay, I understand that I can't target everyone, but I, I need to, to get something out the door and there's already a good market or a number of people using Android 4.0 and up or 4.4 and up as well as iOS 8 and up. I mean, there's I have a big audience already. I don't need to shoot for the world. I just needed to get something out the door. Now, native scrolling, you're going to get that fluid flick of a finger, and you're going to see it fly to the bottom and fly to the top. Depending on your Cortova settings, it can either stop immediately, or it can do that nice little bounce if you're on iOS. On Android, it used to do that, but people got sued. Apple sued people, and people had, you know, Android had to remove that functionality, Samsung and, and others. So when you scroll up or down, you'll see like a highlight happen or some other type of indicator that you've hit the bottom. Virtual scrolling is a big deal because it's actually one of the biggest problems when you see performance issues with Cordova. And again, that's the paper rice idea where you, you introduce some element into a virtual scroll and it immediately starts to degrade your experience. And for a lot of developers, they don't know what that is. It's, it's until you run into it, you're like, oh, okay, well, 
I, I can't um, use uh, position relative at all. I can't use any type of positioning because for whatever reason, as soon as it's turned on, you get this really slow scrolling effect. It's those little things that just really destroy the user experience. That that's the paper rice effect. You you step in one, you know, you make one little wrong step and you make the hole in it, and you just you just destroy your application. So all is not lost, but you have to be able to limit your device range and limit your platform range. So there's other things you can do with virtual scroll to help kind of you know, alleviate some of these problems, or you can just say, I don't care about virtual scroll. It's not that important. Um, an example of this is they're, you know, like Kendall UI, jQuery mobile, Dojo mobile, their virtual scroll isn't really that smart. Uh, if you have 400 elements, it's going to create 400 DOM elements, which you can all going to scroll through. And so your virtual scroll, even though it's to help some of this stuff becomes another issue with walking on paper. You went wrong step. You didn't, why can't you not have an infinite list? Why can't you have thousands of list items? Well, because the DOM isn't that smart. The HTML browser isn't that smart. With a native app, what it usually does, it only displays like eight, uh, eight list items at a time and then cycles through the last one, brings it up to the bottom, and shows that one. So you're only using like eight elements. And there's some frameworks out there that do that. So I think Ionic's one of them. Um, but like React.js is another that uses a virtual DOM. Uh, and I think Vue might also use that too. But it's just some examples of if you really need like this infinite list of a long scrolling something, you may have to jump out of the framework and bring something else in. And it starts to get into the fact that, okay, well, you have to make your first app. You have to make those mistakes in order to start to really understand, okay, what can I really not do? Or you need some type of expert to sit there and tell you, hey, by the way, if you're going to have a long list, um, don't show it or find some other way. And the last part with performance is just CSS. This thing is, I mean, there's, there's already so many issues with learning it for the browser. But learning it for a mobile device is so much more worse. There's, there's so many limitations, so many issues that you can run into very easily that hit the performance issues. And, you know, there's there's a, a website out there that let you know kind of what Chrome does. And a lot of these browsers kind of do that too, where if you're just doing animations, make sure you do like translate with uh, 3D coordinates or something like that so you can get the 3D rendering happening or kick in with the hardware rendering. But overall, it's just really hard to gauge what is bad CSS. And some of these older frameworks out there, they use all the bad CSS. Um, you know, if you're using gradients, and you're just using all this fancy hard CSS stuff that you just, it just creates all this um, complicated rendering process. It makes your app slow. And there's, there's nothing I can really give advice to for that other than, you know, stick with what you can see for what you should not be doing on mobile. So that kind of wraps up the, the end part of a performance. The other part I want to talk about um, is what is Cordova? So all the stuff I'm talking about, the performance, and all this has nothing to do with Cordova. I can tell you that right now. Cordova has nothing to do with performance issues. Now, if you're doing real-time processing with an image or a video or something like that, and you're kicking data from JavaScript back to native code and, and back to JavaScript, and you're noticing it takes a long time to send these bytes back and forth to process it, that's Cordova. The API between JavaScript and native code is Cordova. So when you're showing a, a notification, when you're showing a, um, um, like geolocations and all this other stuff, that is Cordova. When you're interacting with SQL Lite or WebSQL or um, IndexedDB, depending on if you're using a, a wrapper or not, that is Cordova or Cordova plugins. So it's understand under it's you have to understand that difference that Cordova is really not the browser that you're throwing all this CSS and JavaScript and DOM into. And understanding that it's just an API to talk between JavaScript and native code. 
So I want to show you guys something, actually. I, I said this was going to be mostly um, an audio podcast, but, you know, just for this one instance, I want to show you Ace. Now, this is a brand new Microsoft product, but I, I, I want to urge the importance of this thing. Microsoft Ace, or I'll just call it Ace for now, um, allows you to take that bridge, that Cordova bridge between jo talking with JavaScript and native APIs, and allowing you to basically blend in native UI with your with your HTML. So an example of this is you know your your header or your footer is native. So when you, or the the actual panel is native. So there's another project out there that, that that does this where you hit the back button, and a transition that you happens is actually two different um, two different panels that it's running and they're native panels. They're not web views. They're actually like, you know, pain or whatever it's called for iOS and Android. This is, this is taking it to the next level. You can literally put, you know, you can isolate your HTML into a single area, or you can actually start to render native elements on top of your web view. It's not directly inside of it, but it's on top of it. And you can do quite amazing things with this. I mean, you think about if you really wanted to, you can do a completely native experience. Now, there's some caveats to this. So I've already tried Android Ace. The part to this that's a caveat is XAML markup. Now, XAML, I, I don't know if you know about Xamarin, but it's, it's a way to... Uh, Xamarin Forms lets you kind of use XAML to build UI for both Android and iOS. And then you just kind of replace out the, um, the interfaces with you know, geolocation or push notifications or whatever you want to do. There's some users already some libraries available there, but you just you just focus on building the UI in one single language, which is called XAML. This offers it too, which I thought was amazing. It the fact that you have to understand it only works in Visual Studio. To be able to use the XAML features, you have to have Visual Studios, meaning you have to have Windows. And if you want to, you know, run it through um, to get compiled, you're probably going to want to use Taco. And I'll talk about Taco in a little bit, but basically you're going to use Taco to relay it to your iOS server or um, X OS X server to do the build and then get you the build and so you can put it back in your phone. And as long as you at least have one build with the native plugins, then you can use Taco to kind of get the updates going through your app. You don't have to keep building it over and over again. But you have to have Visual Studio, and so that's that's something I hope they they really do uh, work around, but this is this is really new. This is only like a week old at most. And so let me talk about some of the things that you'll you'll run into with, with Cordova. And the first thing is build and reload. I've used Telerik's platform and Telerik basically uses Cordova and provides this amazing um, builder. This it is you know IDE basically that lets you debug your uh, your your application in real time um, with the browser, both in the web or on you know a desktop browser or a desktop. And it only supports Windows for their true IDE, but it's really powerful. Like you don't even need a Mac; it does the build for you in the cloud. But it's kind of expensive. I think it's like $79 a month um, just to have that privilege. And if all you need is just to be able to not have to constantly do another build, deploy it to your phone, and then run it, or on the emulator, deploy it to your emulator and run it, then what you're going to want to use is something like Taco. So let me just go to Taco real quick. Now, Taco is another... Microsoft product and they created this for Visual Studio so when you make Cordova apps you can use Visual Studio and you you basically get live reload on iOS and Android you can make a change and when you change it you see the change happening in your application that is borderline just efficiency right there now the caveat to this and one of the issues that I've I've seen is iOS 9 has effectively done something that has been destroying Cordova for iOS 9. 
And even though they're making leadways and headways to making a better HTML experience, iOS 9 broke the OLED view. And here's why. It has really, really bad memory leaks. Any long-running application will eventually just crash. And I mean long-running as if you just have that, like that list of 400 images on a single page and you go back to it later, it's already going to be out of memory because it's just there's, it's bleeding memory so quickly and so badly and there's no way to recover that you have to use the newer web view that iOS 8 introduced. But iOS 8 introduced the new web view and broke web SQL. So now you have an trade off of between, okay, well, I, I, I have no choice. I need to use, use the new web view, but I don't have web SQL. Well, then you can use Cordova to kind of re-implement that. Not a problem. But you're like, you know what? I want to use IndexedDB. That's a new feature. No, it's broken. It's broken in iOS 8 and it's broken in iOS 9 too. So you're going to have to be stuck with web SQL again which is fine. I mean, it's not necessarily the end all of everything. But then you run into the fact that you have to run a web server in your app in order to get local data. And I mean local, not not just, you know, getting the, 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 the HTML, the CSS or images from your app, but there's, there's things like documents or temporary directories where I need to write something to a, to another folder outside my app because I don't have access to write inside of it. So let's say I want to save a picture, but I want to save a picture and make some thumbnails or something, put it in a documents folder. You can't actually retrieve that in iOS 9. I mean, there's no way to do it unless you have a freaking web server. So they make a web server so you can get around that. Great, just perfect. But then guess what breaks? Taco. Taco doesn't work. You can't get live reload because now you're running a web server on top of this. So you can't, I mean, it's just, it's it's infuriating that you you eventually just go through this and you're like, oh my gosh, I need files. I need it's the fundamentals to using this thing. Like I've lost CDV file and I lost file. I can't call to either one of those in the web browser to get anything to load. What am I going to do? And you just, you you literally get stuck into this thing, the old process. Make a build, run it, debug it through Safari or or, where, or Chrome. If it crashes or you try to debug it, and you know, it's just like, it's just, you, you start running through, I'm shaving the act. I'm like, I'm, I just got to get this done. Then the last part of this is, you know, let's say you use something like Promises and you're, you're doing I.O. with Promises specifically to disk I.O. with promises. Now, if you don't know what a promise is in JavaScript, specifically ES6, the newer version of JavaScript, that promises are supported in most new um, devices, it lets you kind of do an asynchronous callback without having this kind of nested type of fill. Now, there's some caveats to that where everything needs to be a promise if you want to keep chaining it. So it's, it's almost like a wait and a sync, but not really. But... Let's say you're do, you're reading a file, and you you halt it. You you know you put a little breakpoint in your debugger. And you're like, okay, I read the file. What do I get? Oh, oh, okay. Let me wait. What happened? I've lost everything. And what happened is, even though you're using promises, you lost your process. Like it never freaking finishes. You don't get to that next. You know, you fire off another promise, and it never happens. And it's like, what the heck's going on? Well, I mean, that's kind of by design. You're not supposed to hold up um, a file for that long. And so, okay, now you're on iOS 9. you got to use a new web view. Um, and it, you can't save files and show them in the web browser. So now you got to use a web server. But then it breaks your taco. And now you can't really, um, you know, debug your application very well if you're doing disk I.O., I mean, this is the kind of stuff that makes people quit, that makes them go to freaking insanity when dealing with a Cordova app. And a lot of this happens just because it's it's the environment. Every time an app updates, you risk your application breaking far worse than any other native app ever. And there's there's nothing I can really help you guys with that. I mean, there's nothing, no amount of advice that I have other than that is a real risk you're going to have to take. I mean, imagine for anyone that built an iOS 7 application. And you know what? It didn't do well, but they have to kind of write it out and wait for money to come in through in-app purchases or something. 
and iOS 8, 9 came out, and now everyone's saying their app crashes. And for them to try to fix it, it's just all this freaking work to go through. Now, I'm not here to, to kind of bash Cordova because it has true values. But one of the values I think it does not have, at least in a way that you want something to be a consumer app, is exactly that. You can't build a great user experience with Cordova that targets all the platforms, that works efficiently, and that gives you the best of the best. It's just that's the reality. And so I'll recommend Cordova to a lot of businesses for, you know, business end type of applications where, you know, if, if it's not that really that quick or they hit on an input and the cursor somewhere else on the screen or maybe they tap a button a couple of times, it, that's OK. It's not the end of the world. They're not really paying for that. They're just paying for the usage um, to be able to use something on a mobile device. And so that's where I, I kind of want to put this off and, and hold off for now. I would definitely like other people's advice when dealing with Cordova. I've dealt with it over the years, and it's just it's been one of the most frustrating things to experience if you cannot control the client. Like if you're actually building a consumer app and you're telling them that, hey, by the way, we can't do this, they're going to start to get upset and be like, well, you didn't tell me I couldn't do this before. And then you're, you're saying, well, I can't tell you everything I can't do. I mean, I would be here all day. I mean, I'm sure this podcast is going off long enough as it is already. But it's, it's something to understand that if you have direct control, you have the ability to make decisions to make this Cordova app, PhoneGap app, Ionic app, as good as you can for what it can do. But just don't try to go beyond it. You know, this is all paper rice going in and going paper rice come right come back out. So just be careful on the technology you choose. And with that, I say good luck. I definitely do recommend Cordova. Um, it's, it's just not for everything. <laughs> and just choose wisely.